conditions in people with diabetes. Uh, we'll cover the current challenges for the HTA community, uh, the potential benefits of novel prediction models, and what we can expect from HTX in the months ahead. NICE is one of three HTA agencies collaborating on the HTX project, uh, with many partner organisations listed here, uh, led by the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Briefly, the project seeks to develop methods to allow for the assessment of complex health interventions, particularly things that aren't often evaluated directly in randomised trials, such as combinations and sequences of therapies. Uh, the project will leverage um, non-traditional data sources, such as non-randomised studies, and draw on novel artificial intelligence methods and capture value considerations, and hopefully will lead to the ability to make better and more personalised healthcare decisions. <clears throat> uh, for more information and to see some of the project's uh, outputs and deliverables so far, I recommend you visit the HTX website, which is listed there. Uh, HTX is made up of several complementary work packages shown here. Uh, broadly, tasks in the top half of this slide are focused on developing methods, and tasks in the lower half are focused on implementing those methods into healthcare decision-making practices in a range of different settings. Uh, much of the methods development work is being set in the context of four specific case studies. Uh, three of these are looking at the varied indications shown here, but today we'll focus on case study number two, uh, which focuses on monitoring and treatment pathways in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So, why is diabetes an interesting case study from the perspective of an HTA organisation like NICE? Well, firstly, uh, because there are many, many treatments available for diabetes. Uh, many of these are also used in double and triple combinations and at different intensities. And I'm sure there are some that are not shown on this slide, uh, including digital technologies. So this many treatment options provides a really challenging but interesting situation for healthcare decision making particularly when we're thinking about the optimal treatment for a particular person and, and potentially the optimal sequence of treatments. Uh, next, the, the diabetes population is a very heterogeneous group of people, so a one-size-fits-all treatment approach is unlikely to be best for everyone. Uh, as an example, the chart here shows a recent review of comorbidities in people with type 2 diabetes in England. And after two years from diagnosis, the majority of people have two or more comorbidities on top of their diabetes, which require individualised holistic care and, and might affect their diabetes treatment needs. A particular challenge is the use of surrogate outcomes in diabetes. So both types are long term conditions, but trials are generally short. So they report treatment effects on things like blood glucose and body mass. Uh, but HTA agencies like NICE um, and ZIN uh, need to make decisions about lots of different conditions. So really, we want to know how treatment affects things like survival and quality of life and healthcare costs. So we need to predict or understand what a change in diabetes specific outcome means for the outcomes that we're most interested in. And understanding that relationship introduces a lot of uncertainty. And related to that previous point, uh, there are lots of prediction models available to estimate that link between short term diabetes specific outcomes and things like survival. So we need to decide which is best for our decision making situation. Some models might use local data, some are old and some are new, some are difficult to access. Uh, and as a result of these differences, they often make very different predictions. Uh, very briefly, uh, here we can see the outcomes from 10 different diabetes prediction models after applying the same treatment effect of a 10 unit reduction in systolic blood pressure. Now, this is predicted, this reduction is predicted to improve life expectancy according to the blue dots on the vertical axis and improve quality adjusted survival according to the red dots. And the higher the dot on the vertical axis, the better the survival benefit or quality adjusted survival benefit. Now, you can see both the blue and red dots have a really wide spread from top to bottom. And that means depending on which model we prefer to use to, to estimate this relationship, that fixed 
observed blood pressure reduction could be predicted to have a really small effect on the key outcomes for our decision making or a really large effect on those outcomes. And so the prediction model we use can, can clearly have a really important impact on how effective and cost effective a treatment looks and therefore on reimbursement decisions. So here's today's agenda. Um, the first two presentations will introduce existing prediction models and how they contribute to the decision models that are used ultimately for HTA decision making. And the subsequent two presentations will set the scene for what we might see coming out of the HTX project in the months ahead. And at the end, um, there should be some time for audience questions and comments, and we'll also take a screenshot um, of the webinar. So without further ado, I'm pleased to hand over to Xin Yu Li, a researcher at Groningen University, to talk to us about existing prediction models. Thank you, Jamie. Oh, OK, so good morning, everyone. My name is Xin Yu Li. And uh, I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Groningen. I'm doing the project simulation modeling for economic evaluation in type 2 diabetes under the supervision of Th Professor Talisa Finstra. It's my great pleasure to be here to share our findings from a scoping review about the use of risk prediction models in type 2 diabetes decision models. This is the outline. Firstly, I will briefly introduce what do we mean exactly by a prediction model and show their common model characteristics and explain why we need prediction models. And to make it explicitly, I will summarize some commonly used prediction models in type 2 diabetes health economic models as examples. And then we will look at a general structure of the health economic model and see where prediction models are incorporated exactly and how they might play an important role in our final cost effectiveness results. Then we will look at some methodology to apply prediction models into health economic models. For example, how can we handle with the integration of different prediction models and how to consider treatment effects on different time scale? <laughs> so first of all, what is a prediction model? Prediction model basically use the information about an individual at a given time to compute the risk of a future outcome. Below is a typical example. This is a model for five year risk of cardiovascular disease in type two diabetes evaluated from Swedish National Diabetes Register. And basically, if we input patients characteristics like age, duration, diabetes duration, and HbA1c level, and so on, we will have the risk of a cardiovascular disease occurs for the patient with this risk profile. And you may recognize that this is a typical Cox regression model, which is a widely used semi-parametric model. It's widely used because it's distribution-free and the baseline hazard does not need to be specified. Well, we also have other typical forms of prediction models, depending on the characteristics of outcomes that we would like to predict. Either it's time to event outcomes, such as the time until certain events occurs, that's what we see most commonly, or binary outcomes like smoking status, where we usually have a yes or no answer, or count outcomes like the number of events occurred, or continuous outcomes like next year's HB1C level. There are many distributions or models suitable for predicting them based on their characteristics accordingly. Well, then how can we benefit from estimating this model is then the next question. There are mainly three goals of prediction models. Initially, they were used to support clinical decision making. For example, the Q-Risk assessment tool might form an important part of health check. The Q-Risk is intrinsically a Cox model and we can input individuals age, gender and other risk factors to compute an individual's risk of developing cardiovascular disease over the next 10 years. And if the calculated risk is above 10%, clinicians might be advised to use statin therapy for the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. That's how prediction models support clinical decision making. While the prediction models can also contribute to a better understanding of disease, for example, the Q-risk model also indicated systolic blood pressure were associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And the third goal is to inform the health economic model. 
as listed here, different complications of type 2 diabetes lead to distinct and diverse cause and quality. So that accurately predict which and when event occur helps update the event occurrence and to inform health economic model and update the cost and quality accordingly so that we can have a better estimation of patients lifetime trajectory or quality cost and either. And there are some commonly used prediction models in type 2 diabetes health economic models based on our finding from the scoping review. Basically, we identified 29 key health economic models that applied prediction models. And this table listed the prediction models that they applied. From this table, we can see that UKBDS and Framham are the most commonly used prediction models. And Cox regression is commonly applied and also a parametric model as well. Well, here the proportion does not sum up to one because there might be some overlap. A health economic model actually can apply multiple prediction models at the same time, either for different complication. For example, the SPHR model here, it applied UKBDS for retinopathy, neuropathy, and uh, nephropathy, while Framingham model for heart failure and cure risk for stroke. Well, the health economic model may also provide multiple options for prediction models. Like the echo here, it provides user with a choice with three sets of risk equations, like the UKBDS or the NDR and also at once. Given here, there are multiple prediction models available for use. How to incorporate them to build up a health economic model is then the next question. This is the, a typical example of the patient level diabetes model. We can go through quickly and see how prediction models help. Uh, so a patient enters the model and then the prediction model here can inform us whether the complication occurs or not by comparing a random number drawn from a uniform distribution ranging from 0 to 1. If the random number is less than the predicted risk, we predict that an event occurs. And then we can update the complication cost and quality accordingly for this cycle. And basically we do the same thing each cycle until patient dies. And for each complication here, there might be a different prediction model. And the important part here is the interdependency of prediction models. For example, the event history of the IHD might increase the probability of stroke. So if we run the IHD prediction model first, the probability of stroke might increase. So if prediction models are interdependent, then the order of applying prediction models will influence the estimated outcomes. And we identified five methods of handling these ordering problems. First of all, if events are assumed to be independent from each other, then of course simultaneous evaluation is fine because they anyway will not affect the result of each other. And if events are interdependent, we need to order prediction models with caution to avoid bias. And these solutions were identified. The random order is a very popular choice. Equations for complications are executed in random order. And if an event is predicted to occur in a given cycle, it will inform the remaining set of equations still to be estimated in the same cycle. It's an easy solution by randomness to reduce bias. And the sunflower method is another choice. Unlike the UKBDS equation, some prediction models such as the QRISC, it predicts aggregate cardiovascular disease. So the sunflower method actually divides it into individual event types like myocardial infection or stroke, by real-world relative frequency of the events. And simultaneous running is also possible by using the event information in last cycle, such as in the Mikado, so that the prediction models will not affected by events occur in this cycle anyway. And predefined order is not that commonly used, only a model called TGRE applied this. It run uh, stroke, coronary heart failure, and neuropathy and retinopathy in parallel as they did not depend on each other, well then the amputation predict mo prediction model was wrong afterwards, which includes the retinopathy as a predictor. Well, some models did not clearly state their integrating method. This also indicates the needs of transparency in future studies. And one of the most important goal of health economic model is to measure the cost effectiveness of treatment 
So how treatment information is incorporated is therefore another important part to discuss. There are mainly two main methods. Either include the use of prediction model as a dummy variable in prediction models or assume treatment only impact through risk factors or say the independent variables such as HbA1c, BMI, and in turn, they will affect the outcome of prediction models. And our study found that currently only the use of antihypertensive medication is included in prediction models, and the effect of glucose, glucose control treatment is somehow consistent as assuming treatment only impacts through risk factors. And then another problem to discuss is the time scale, because most health economic models use annual cycle. It's of course fine and easy to apply annually constructed prediction models into health economic models such as UQBDS, but then some models is established for a longer interval, like 10 years for Q-risk, and we identified two solutions to fit the time scale. The first one is algebraic compression by constant rate assumption. For example, one model called JDM, it used Framingham risk equation for cardiovascular di disease, where the time interval of 4 to 12 years were recommended. So they calculated the incidence rate for the next four years and then converted to an annual rate by dividing the results by four to get a constant incidence rate for the next one year. And another solution is baseline survival-based models. For example, the model called SBHR, it applied survival function at year one, risk to the power of um, the Q risk two coefficient and individuals characteristics to compute the annual risk to fit the time scale of the model. To sum up, today we have discussed about some common predic prediction models characteristics and how we consider their integration, treatment effect, and time scale. And this also leads us to some points for fu future discussion, like the transparency. Although reporting and transparency guidelines exist for health economic models or prediction models, such as chairs or triple checklist, they usually miss some valuable aspects for integrating prediction models with the purpose of subsequently using them in health economic models. And also the rationale of selecting prediction models is also not that clearly stated in most cases. The frequently selected prediction models that does not necessarily mean the best suitable prediction model. We might need to consider the prediction model best match the demographic characteristics or clinical setting of the individual patient. Also, there were several other question marks that we might have, like how can we evaluate model performance and whether advanced model can be applied or not. These interesting questions will be further discussed in Junfeng's talk later today. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Yu, for that really concise introduction to, um, the, I guess, the state of play with IBT's prediction models. Um, and that will hopefully lead really nicely into our next presentation by Rijo Z. Daly, a uh, medical doctor at University College London Hospitals Trust, who's going to talk to us about how VT's models are ultimately received by and perceived by uh, HDA agency. Can you see the presentation? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good morning. Um, my name is Mary J. C. Daly. I'm an anaesthetist, originally from Geneva University Hospital, currently working in London. I will present the key findings of a review we undertook for the economic model submitted to, to NICE uh, for the technology appraisal programme for treatment of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The objective um, of the review was to identify what are the predictive model shortcomings, how are they dealt with, and how does it impact uh, decision making and ultimately affect price recommendation? So for those of you who might not be familiar uh, with the NICE TA process, so NICE is tasked with providing coverage guidance to NHS England and Wales. And in the UK, manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies seeking reimbursement by the NHS for their new technologies 
to more systematically undergo health technology assessment. So applying companies must provide evidence of their products, clinical and cost effectiveness, commonly in the form of cost utility analysis and in accordance with NICE standards. The choice of the model is however left to the submitting companies and then the submissions are reviewed by a designated technology appraisal committee uh, before final appraisal determination is reached. The application is also thoroughly examined by an independent external academic organisation, the Evidence Review Group, who comprehensively appraise the accuracy and the robustness of the evidence presented by the company. So the review was undertaken in April 2021. The review was limited to up-to-date TAs for the treatment of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. It didn't include the treatment for diabetes-related complication. And of course, TAs not employing economic models were excluded. It did not either include the reports, other reports produced by NICE that might also make use of uh, economic predictive models. So the data reviewed uh, included EIG reports and all the subsequent follow-up documents produced by the EIG. The final appraisal documents produced by the TA committee unveiling the process of decision-making. And sometimes, although models were often comprehensively described in EIG reports, we sometimes also had to review company submissions directly to clarify certain elements or to seek clarification in the documents published by the model developers in subsequent peer review journals. ERG reports in fact documents are in the public domain once they are published and so therefore no ethical approval was warranted to do the review. So in our review we focus on different aspects of modelling such as uh, models design in compliance with NICE standards, meaning the reference case, the sources of data for models input, uh, clinical data, cost utilities, etc. We identify the key assumptions underpinning the models, the key drivers of costs, uh, cost effectiveness, as well as model shortcomings. We also looked at whether the predictive mo models fulfilled American Diabetes Association guidelines on the computer modeling of diabetes. Sorry, um, MJ, just to interrupt, um, there's a there's a message box uh, blocking part of the slide. I don't know if it's possible to remove that. Uh, is, is it gone? Yeah, thank you. Right, okay. So um, the results, 10 current TAs uh, dealt with the treatment of type 1 and type 2 diabetes per se. Two consisted of cost comparison and cost minimization analysis, so they are highlighted in red, so they were excluded of the review. And of the eight TAs we examine, seven pertain to the new treatment glyphosin, which is an oral antidiabetic drug that is effective in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. In the case of type 2 diabetes, glyphosin was set sometimes as single, double or triple therapy for adults when compared to the standard of care. The only other type of technology uh, examined was continuous subcutaneous infusion devices that was presented through a cross-industry submission. So there were essentially five different uh, predictive models used, core, Cardiff with a variant which was called DCEM, UKPDSOM, ECO T2DM, and a de novo model that was eventually rejected because deemed unreliable. So the company had to resubmit another model and used the core model. So for type 1 diabetes model, our review showed that type 1 diabetes model have limited external validity proficiency. They also have undergone fewer external validity reviews, such as by the Mount Hood Challenge. 
Uh, there is uncertainty as to the predictive accuracy of the models beyond 10 years. There is also limited availability of robust clinical data to derive type 1 diabetes risk equation, compelling the use in some instances for some complication of type 2 risk equation. Type 1 models are also unsuitable to model children, despite type 1 diabetes onset often being in childhood and despite technologies nonetheless being aimed at that population. Type 1 models might not include a sufficient range of events as some complications are insufficiently captured in models such as cognitive impairment associated with hyperglycemia in qualies were also insufficiently capturing the impact of these events on quality of life. For type 2 models, the reports underline that model also, type 2 uh, diabetes models also have a limited external validity proficiency as their predictive accuracy has not not been robustly tested beyond 5 to 10 years. And there is also uncertainty over the predictive accuracy of certain drivers in models such as glucated hemoglobin or body mass index, uh, for example, HbA1c has limited accuracy of predicting macrovascular complication, and there is insufficient data to link body weight or BMI changes with hard outcomes. And things that were true for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes predictive models. So uh, there was a lack of transparency in general. Um, Numerous models were described as black boxes by the ERG who were unable to reproduce or cross-check results. There is uncertainty regarding the predicted accuracy of risk equation because they are derived from, derived from RCTs and so many don't reflect the general outcome of the general population. Furthermore, as patients in RCTs uh, were deteriorating, uh, in terms of glycemic control, they would have undergone treatment intensification. So risk equation, in effect, double count the effects of therapy escalation. And the review also highlights the limited scope of external validity appraisals, as most of them focus on predictive accuracy of hard outcomes, but do not ascertain their reliability at predicting overall cost or quality. So the impact of models limitation on decision making. So we found that eventually all eight technologies were approved by the TA committees, yet to tackle model shortcoming and persistent uncertainties, the, com the committees strongly relied on clinical experts to, for example, decide on the most likely scenario when extrapolating beyond the duration of RCTs. Clinical experts also affected decision-making by, for example, emphasizing certain aspects that were insufficiently captured in their opinion in models, such as the impact of hypoglycemia or the technology's benefit to children. But in general, although all technologies were approved, uncertainty surrounding cost-utility analysis results subsequently led to restriction in NICE's recommendation of the drug restricting the access to the technology only to certain patients, for example, those not responsive to another class of drug. So to conclude, the review confirms that economic uh, prediction models are critical tools in guiding NICE's decision-making for type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes technologies. Nonetheless, uncertainties regarding prediction models accuracy impact NICE recommendation. Clinical experts play a critical role in mitigating uncertainty surrounding models accuracy and underlying assumptions. In predictive models, uncertainties reinforce the need for NICE to proceed with regular and consistent technology reappraisals with the aim of exploiting potential updates in clinical effectiveness data or substantial improvements in diabetes-specific economic model structure and design. That's all for me.
Thank you, Marie Josie, for demonstrating that these prediction models um, are really important contributors to the wider decision uncertainty that bodies like NICE and HTA organisations um, have to make decisions around. Uh, I'll now hand over to uh, Jose Tapia, a researcher at the Technical University of Madrid, uh, to talk to us about uh, the work that is currently ongoing uh, within HTX. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Could you see my presentation? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you all for being here and thank you for inviting us to participate in the webinar. Uh, my name is Jose Tapia. I am from the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid and we work in the case study two of the HTX project uh, focused on diabetes. Uh, I am going to present um, our work on developing novel models to predict the effectiveness of diabetes treatment strategies. And I will also mention our current uh, progress and results. Our role in the HDX project is to provide individualized treatment and monitoring strategies in patients with different types of diabetes. Uh, we are considering type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, between the variables that we are considering, uh, we have drugs and not only the consumption of uh, insulin or oral antidiabetics, uh, but also the delivery methods such as multiple dose injection or continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. Uh, we consider also uh, the different monitoring devices such as uh, glucose meter and continuous uh, glucose monitoring systems. And uh, we also uh, include, if available and if possible, technological and educational strategies uh, such as e-health or m-health tools and some lifestyle interventions uh, regarding physical activity, diet, sleep, etc. Uh, between our aims in the case study is using data from randomized, con uh, randomized uh, controlled trials and real world data for assessing the different sequence of treatments and monitoring pathways. Uh, that way, that way uh, we can combine information uh, regarding uh, tre different treatments, monitoring strategies, educational patterns and technological uh, approaches if available for feeding uh, artificial intelligence algorithms. Uh, and we want uh, to identify uh, patient subgroups to benefit from different alternatives and develop prediction models or prognostic scores uh, to predict disease outcomes, including uh, treatment effectiveness and cost effectiveness, uh, and for guiding uh, patients to uh, individualized therapy. Uh, in the case of study two, uh, we work together with the University of Maastricht and the Utrecht University, both from the Netherlands, with the Syrian Research Institute in Hungary, uh, with the Medical University of Sofia in Bulgaria, and with the University of Oulu, of Lu, Oulu in Finland. And in the case of Studio 2 also, we have different sources of real-world data. Uh, from the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid, we have been uh, focused in point two and four. Uh, point two is the clinical practice uh, research uh, data link, which is well known as uh, CPRD. Uh, from that, we are using data related with type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, CPRD uh, contains information uh, uh, regarding electronic health records from general practice in the UK and with more than 14 years of follow-up. And the point four, the other database that we are using is a type 1 diabetes exchange, uh, which is the database that uh, we have used for the results that we are going uh, to present today in the, in the webinar. Uh, the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange database contains longitudinal information uh, from patients with Type 1 diabetes between 2007 and 2018. It includes more or less 34,000 participants in the United States. And from that, uh, we selected adult patients at the time of enrollment with information uh, on insulin treatment and with more than one visit. Uh, for that reason, we finally uh, selected a total amount of 9,156 uh, 9, uh, participants. All the available longitudinal information includes clinical data, diagnosis, demographic information, complications related with type 1 diabetes, and the different treatments that the patients uh, follow. Uh, first of all, uh, we extracted all the features at enrollment and during the follow-up uh, for each visit uh, of each patient 
and we uh, completed where possible all missing information with data from other visits of the same patient and also transforming variables with different unit possibilities to a common one and categorical uh, variables into number. Uh, that way uh, we could describe the different uh, variables that we are using uh, in five uh, big categories. The third one is the demographic information uh, related with the age, gender, age at diagnosis, diabetes duration, or the educational level or annual income of the patient. The second one is the clinical information uh, related with BMI, uh, blood pressure, HbA1c, or triglyceride. We have also information related with monitoring and treatment, such as the use of continuous glucose monitoring or the insulin delivery method, and even the total units of insulin use, uh, including basal insulin or the number of pump bolsters for pump users. Uh, we consider also uh, the insulin type and the changes in and combinations of insulin types uh, during the different visits of the patients and the use of ACE inhibitors uh, for the treatment of hypertension and problems with blood pressure. And finally, uh, we consider also uh, information related with the complications uh, of type 1 diabetes, uh, such as chronic kidney disease, diabetic food, hypertension, or coronary uh, artery disease, among others. Um, one moment. After that, uh, we developed a feature selection step in which we decided to discard those variables with more than 35% of missing values uh, and apply uh, multiple imputation by chain equations for the rest of the variables, which is uh, known as mice imputation. Uh, according to a publication of Mertens et al., when evaluating the performance of the algorithm together with the use of multiple imputation, uh, the imputation model uh, needs to be trained not also with the training data, but also with the predictors of the test set without the, the outcome. Uh, and the reason of that is because uh, we need to go to take into account or consider uh, the missingness pattern of the predictors of the test set. Uh, and that's why we have followed that strategy. Uh, of course, uh, all the process is stratified for ensuring the presence of the different outcome categories. Uh, both in training and testing with the same proportion. Uh, from the point of view of prediction models, we plan to use different typologies of machine learning algorithms, depending, of course, uh, on model performance and interpretability. Uh, right now, we are focused uh, in the use of bidirectional long short term memory neural network. Uh, that architecture uh, could allow us to create a highly interpretable recurrent uh, neural network model for patient diagnosis and without uh, losses in model performance. The purpose of that is making predictions at the same time that we can explain how each medical code at each visit uh, contributes to the prediction, to the final prediction of the model. And with medical codes, we are referring to uh, diagnosis, medication, or some kind of procedure codes. Uh, now we are going to comment our current results. Uh, the long short term memory neural network algorithm has been applied to the type 1 diabetes exchange data that we have previously described uh, for predicting glycemic control at the NSBC. That is typically uh, yearly because uh, patients in the type 1 diabetes exchange uh, project have uh, more or less one visit uh, per year. Uh, we have chosen uh, as the outcome uh, the glycemic control, which has been defined as a binary outcome, uh, considering uh, glycemic control as good if SBA1C is lower than 7.5 and bad glycemic control if HbA1c is greater or equal to 7.5. Uh, it's important to note that uh, with that threshold, we have more or less a balanced data set because 55% uh, percent of the patients uh, achieved uh, a good glycemic control for the last visit, which is the visit that we are going to predict or where we are, uh, we are going to try to predict. And 45% of the patients uh, have a bad glycemic control for the last visit. Uh, the performance assessment uh, was done by repeated five-fold cross-validation. So here we can see some partial and preliminary results. Uh, that we have uh, obtained uh, averaging uh, two different five-fold uh, cross-validation. Uh, we have obtained an area under the rock curve of 0 0.93, uh, 
with an accuracy of 0 0.9 and an F1 score parameter of 0 0.86. Uh, in the next uh, uh, slide, uh, we are going to see uh, some plots uh, related with the area under the curve that we have obtained for each brand of one of the cross validation that we have developed. We have decided to show only one of the cross validations uh, because the other one is very similar uh, to the one that we have uh, seen right now. Um, if we look at the at the plots, we can see that four of the five uh, branches uh, obtain really good uh, areas under the curve, uh, higher than 0 0.95, and only one of the of the branches uh, had a lower performance with an area under the curve of 0 0.76, and that pattern uh, was replicated in the other uh, cross validation. Uh, but in average, uh, the results are uh, quite good, as we have seen in the previous slide. And we are also uh, working in making more cross validation with different partitions for uh, validating that uh, results. Uh, for the next steps, uh, we are uh, investigating different techniques that allow us to obtain uh, calibrated confidence estimates because uh, we know. Uh, the importance of calibration in prediction models, as the other speakers uh, has mentioned too in the presentations. Um, we want to analyze the calibration of our uh, algorithms with calibration plots. Um, but recurrent neural networks are not uh, well known for being well calibrated by themselves. So we are investigating techniques such as temperature scaling or plot scaling. Uh, for obtaining uh, calibrated confidence estimates. Uh, we want also uh, to improve the overall performance of the model, uh, testing other hyperparameter configurations, because we have tried uh, some configurations, but not all of them, and we have uh, some other options that we would like to, to try. Uh, we would like also to perform the same methodology for the prediction of associated complications in patients with type 1 uh, diabetes. Uh, as we have mentioned uh, previously in other slides, uh, we are using uh, information related with associated complications, uh, and we think that we think that would be interesting to try to predict uh, that uh, complication. We are also working with other typologies of algorithms uh, so that we can compare the different performances, the advantages or disadvantages of each, and the future uh, applicability. Uh, and we are also working on processing the information extracted from the CPRD, which is the other database that we are using, as we have uh, previously mentioned, uh, to perform, if not the same methodology, uh, a similar methodology uh, for predicting also glycemic control and associated complications, if possible. And even, uh, even uh, we could try some kind of external validation between the two uh, databases and the different uh, algorithms and um, I think that that's all for uh, from our part. Uh, if you have some question, I will try to to answer it later. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for for being here again. Thank you, Jose. Really interesting update and looking forward to uh, seeing more future outputs. Um, Thank you. Next, I'll hand over to uh, Jopin Wang, Assistant Professor at Utrecht University, who is going to talk, try to envision the future and talk about, uh, I guess, what next for diabetes prediction modeling. Uh, Jopin, please go ahead. Yes, uh, that's actually me. I have my screen and well, turn off my camera. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jopin Wang, Assistant Professor at Utrecht University. And I'm working on the work package one of the HTX project. In the first uh, two presentations, uh, Xin Yu and uh, Marie Jersey uh, gave nice overviews of the current practice in diabetes modeling. And Jose Tapia introduced the new development in our HTX project. As we can see from the name of HTX, uh, Next Generation Health Technology Assessment, uh, in my today's talk, I would like to share some of my opinions on what can we expect from the next generation prediction models in diabetes. The next generation well, sounds really great. Every year when Apple introduces its new iPhone, it is always called a new generation. 
And actually, it's the newest iPhone, iPhone 13, is already uh, it's the 15th generation. So when I look back to all the mobile phones I have used in the past 20 years, and a lot of other phones I would like to have, but I couldn't buy, many of them, they were advertised as the next generation. Uh, in that sense, uh, they are uh, successful in selling their products uh, by using the name of next generation. But it also makes me start thinking, what do we mean by saying uh, next generation? Uh, from my own user's experience, uh, the uh, Ericsson, uh, I think it's 768, uh, seven, so the, the model of the small blue one, is much smaller and lighter than the previous one. I was very happy with that because I can put it in my pocket instead of uh, in my school bag. I would call it only as an improve improvement. Uh, after that, I turned to a Nokia, uh, which had color and uh, bigger screens. I can even play some uh, simple games on them. They are still uh, mobile phones, and I would call this as a, a micro innovation. I had my first iPhone actually very late, yeah, because the good quality of Nokia. And at that time, uh, iPhones were not that smart, so they had touch screens uh, and no keyboards anymore, but only very limited applications were available. So the most often use was still to uh, make phone calls and uh, send text messages. But from there, we can see something is changing, and I see this as a macro uh, innovation. Uh, nowadays, most of us are using uh, smartphones uh, for communication, for watching videos, for contactless payment, or maybe someone, uh, some of you are now using smartphones attending this webinar. So the smartphones, they don't only change the form of mobile phones, they also change our life. So that is a revolution. Okay, so uh, let's come back to today's topic, uh, diabetes prediction models. Uh, what development uh, are happening and what can we expect on different levels of uh, next generation? From improvement uh, to uh, revolution, uh, we are working on or working towards uh, improving the model performance in both uh, model calibration and model discrimination. Uh, simply using machine learning or AI techniques to replace the statistical models or using machine learning or AI to facilitate some advanced analysis cannot be done uh, with uh, traditional statistical models. And in the end, to redefine the framework of health economics modeling uh, with AI and simulation. I will start from uh, improvement. So for improvement, I think we need to pay more attention to model performance. Uh, this calibration hierarchy was used in evaluating clinical prediction models, uh, some of which uh, were used as risk equations in simulation models. However, most health economics models were evaluated only at the mean level, so it's the minimal level. Uh, we only compare the overall event rate versus the prediction average of predicted event rate. When decision making is uh, on population level, uh, this uh, may not be an issue. Uh, but now we are talking more about personalized medicine or personalized decision making for HTA. In that case, uh, risk equations need to be assessed at least at moderate or even uh, at the strong level. Uh, discrimination refers to the ability of the model to separate individuals who develop events from those who do not. Uh, discrimination is another very important performance measure in prediction models, but it's seldom assessed in health economics uh, evaluation. A good discrimination is the basic for good calibration on moderate or strong levels. So if we want to achieve a very good calibration uh, on levels, we need to make sure the calibration, uh, sorry, the dis discrimination is good enough. It can be an interesting research topic to investigate the impact of model uh, discrimination on the outcomes like the total cost or colleagues especially when the probability of having an event and the cost given an event has happened are correlated. So in another case study, so in the case study one within HTX, 
uh, our collaborators, they are working on uh, this uh, topic and they want to uh, evaluate the impact of model performance in terms of both calibration and discrimination on the patients of tongue. Then we move to a micro uh, innovation level. According to the results uh, in CNE's review, uh, most of the prediction models used in current health performance evaluation are generalized linear models. Uh, they are all traditional statistical models. More and more machine learning or AI techniques are used in developing new prediction models. The same also applies to health economics models, where the traditional statistical model can be replaced by machine learning or AI. However, a systematic review shows that machine learning and uh, generalized linear models, more specifically in this case, uh, they refer to a uh, logistic regression, uh, have similar prediction performance when developed from the same data set. While this comparison can be unfair, uh, because models uh, were usually developed uh, with uh, low dimensional data with very small uh, sample size, where machine learning cannot uh, fully benefit from its advantages in dealing with uh, non-linearity, complex interactions, uh, and uh, high dimensional data. So I see machine learning or AI is very promising uh, in uh, developing new prediction models. So macro innovation is also related to uh, machine learning and AI, but here we aim to use them to solve uh, some more difficult issues rather than just simply replacing statistical models. In Xin Yu's presentation, she uh, summarized uh, several different strategies dealing with interdependency between multiple outcomes when prediction models were incorporated in health economics models. With machine learning techniques, uh, this, more, uh, this problem can be solved by using multitask learning for multi-label prediction. We already have a draft plan to work on this uh, direction in HTX Work Package 3. Another potential application is multi-EU disease model. Uh, this is from a project that Xin Yu and I were involved uh, two, year ago, two years ago. A multi-EU disease model is one model suitable for evaluation of a range of current and future uh, healthcare inter interventions. Uh, so in this case, a predefined model structure and the short list of risk factors may not be sufficient to cover all the potential situations where machine learning and AI can play an important role. The term of uh, digital twins is getting popular. Well, I, I was told it is just another name of simulation model, but from my observation, uh, current health economics models are developed based on uh, epidemiological studies or clinical studies. Uh, but with digital twins, we can even incorporate results from basic research. Uh, the implementation of digital twins is also powered by AI. Finally, we get to a revolution. I must say, I do have some ideas on what can we do for improvement, for micro-innovation and macro-innovation. But I don't have a very clear view yet uh, what will be uh, the next, uh, well, what will be the revolution in diabetes modeling. So again, I use one example from another file to imagine what will the next generation look like. So in 2016, AlphaGo uh, won the Go game uh, with the top human player from Korea. Uh, because its complexity, uh, Go was believed never to be mastered by a computer program, but the DeepMind made it. And later, they developed AlphaZero, which is a general purpose algorithm, can teach itself to play several other uh, board games as well. In both games, uh, players take action in turn, and they both have perfect information. So a more challenging task uh, was given to AI. Uh, let's play in uh, real-time strategy games like StarCraft. I also played uh, Warcraft and StarCraft myself, and I didn't think AI will manage this until I saw the game replace AI beat the human players. Real-time strategy games are very similar to real life, and all uh, these features will also have the same uh, problems when we have the 
uh, Diabetes model. So we also uh, we are seeking for the uh, similar solutions uh, in diabetes health economics modeling. I would expect the AI algorithm like uh, Alpha Zero or Alpha Star will redefine the current modeling uh, framework. Uh, to summarize, so we have different levels of uh, next generation. Improvement is happening every day and is always needed. A micro innovation is attractive, but sometimes may be less useful. A macro innovation will bring the modeling practice to a next stage, and this is an uh, achievable goal. Uh, but for revolution, it's still very difficult to imagine, but we can learn from other files. Well, so I'd like to thank Li Zhou, a PhD student in our research group, for his assistance in uh, pre uh, preparing this presentation. Well, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Yung Feng. Um, we're, we have a little bit of time now for perhaps one or two questions from the audience. Um, audience and panel members, feel free to turn your cameras on now. Uh, now the presentations have concluded. Um, and I'll keep an eye out for any raised hands. No raised hands. Um, if I could ask the, ah, there we go. We have one from uh, Wim, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Young Fang, for this uh, very interesting and lively presentation. Um, um, my, my, my first perspective would be, how would this type of, of changes uh, fit into the HEA? Oh, sorry, when we seem to have lost you there uh, midway through your question. Okay. Uh, could you repeat that? You're back now. We, we, I think we missed the question. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, please go ahead. So my question, I, I really liked your presentation, Yung Feng. Um, whether these four things you presented in terms of innovation, changes and evolution, which ones are uh, most relevant to health knowledge assessment? Because some might be much more interesting for what we call shared decision making, because it really relates to the to uh, treatment and 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 outcomes for for patients on an individual level. So, do you foresee that the four stages you actually presented are also in a shorter run uh, relevant to HA decision making, or is this really something on a very long term? Uh, yes. So I would see the first three levels as uh, very relevant to the uh, near future, but for the revolution, maybe it's something uh, very far away from now. Uh, because, uh, well, uh, according to the two reviews uh, in today's presentation, uh, actually we already point out uh, those are uh, something we should improve our current practice. Like we didn't uh, look very closely to the model performance, we only test uh, the, the final outcome. So actually, when we do uh, the evaluation in subpopulation or subgroups, we do need to ensure the model performs well in all the uh, uh, subgroups or even on individual level. So it's something we didn't pay much attention to, but we should do that uh, from now. So I would see the first three levels uh, from improvement to uh, macro innovation, they are all very relevant to the HTA agencies. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm conscious of the time now. Uh, could I invite the presenters to turn cameras on, please? I believe uh, Mary would like to take a uh, screenshot of the workshop. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, of course. If every one of you can turn on your cameras, that would be great. Okay, I see you are turning on. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go count down on three, okay? One, two, 
three. Another. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary, and um, I'll, I'll conclude today's webinar. Thank you again to all of our presenters and thank you everybody for, for joining the webinar today. Uh, I hope it's been insightful and um, hopefully see more outputs from HTX in this area soon. Bye bye.